We're ready to go. Ready when you are. Excellent. Welcome everybody. Um, delighted to welcome you this afternoon or this morning, wherever you are in the world, um, to our World of Private Clients webinar series, specifically focusing today on transparency and reporting. Um, always a topic um, of conversation um, in, with, with clients or socially, I'm sure. Lots going on in the world and we're hoping to give you a very topical update, not only on um, international cooperation Operation, but also giving you some insight into what's going on in our particular countries um, and LACIS information that will be relevant to your clients. Next slide, please. So in terms of the agenda, I won't talk for too long. I'm going to pass over to my colleagues very shortly, but just to give you a little bit of an update on the current landscape um, and just um, hopefully we whet your appetite for some questions and answers at the end. Um, we will be opening the floor for questions uh, towards the end of the hour. So please do submit uh, questions to us um, as we go along and we'll deal with them at the end and the chat chat function should be facilitated for that. Also, um, in terms of uh, any notes that you want to make, we will be circulating a copy of the slides and a recording um, after this to everybody on the mail list. Next slide, please. So I'll give you a brief introduction, then I'll pass over to my colleagues to allow them to introduce themselves. I'm coming back to you at the end um, from the UK to give you a bit of an update on what's happening uh, here in the UK with HM Revenue and Customs. But what's been happening globally? Um, well, very much this is driven by the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. So the OECD, I'm sure many of you are familiar with their work. It's not new. Um, they have been incredibly focused on this for many years. But if you look at what's happening in a lot of countries and particularly uh, uh, the jurisdictions we represent, a lot of it is driven by research agreements that originate from the OECD. And this is big news. And I always say to private clients, um, best to be educated and aware. Um, we do meet clients who are the opposite ends of the spectrum. So I call it either blissful ignorance or blind panic. Um, ideally, we don't want private clients in either of those categories. We want them in the educated and aware, awareness um, category. And, and that's really the purpose of today. Um, so OED, OECD very much focused on global transparency. They have 163 member countries. So this is very big news for um, all of uh, your um, clients, um, particularly clients who are internationally mobile. Originally, their work was largely looking at banking secrecy back in 2009, for those of you who remember the G20 summit then. Since then, they've been very focused on really two agendas. One is the automatic transfer of information, and the other is information requests. So that is country to country, usually where there is a specific uh, uh, issue, either an investigation or, or an obvious problem. And you can see from the latest data from the OECD on this slide, the reason for doing that is really the money collected by uh, various governments around the world. Um, so it has driven tax investigations and it has driven over a hundred billion pounds, uh, sorry, billion euros that is in of additional revenues since the OECD work on transparency began. So, Rightly or wrongly, you know, the justification for um, a lot of the drive for transparency is there in, in, in the numbers. And the amount of data um, 
that is now transferred uh, is quite staggering. So we've got um, the value of financial accounts of 10 trillion euros on, on this slide. So without further ado, I will pass over um, uh, to um, my first colleague. Um, so hearing about beneficial ownership and economic substance, thank you. Thanks, Don, and, and certainly welcome to, to everyone on the call today. It, as Don said, it's, it's, it's kind of a, um, uh, a very timely webinar, especially given uh, the recent events, um, certainly the, the Pandora Papers recently that was, that was released, and then, uh, and then lately on corporate minimum tax, uh, the whole debate. So certainly, I think the topics that will be covered today will, will offer a little bit of insight and, and hopefully uh, whet your appetite in terms of what's, what's to come, I guess, globally, and what we're certainly facing and what you're likely facing with your clients or, or if you are a client. Um, what I wanted to start out with today is is just a quick um, a, a quick quotation from from the recent BDO transparency report, which I think was apt sort of to set the scene. Um, it essentially comes from the first paragraph in the report, which says the transparency agenda has been central to private client planning for some time. Our recent re our research reveals a clear understanding that acceptance that transparency requirements are not only here to stay, but all but set to strengthen, broaden, and deepen. The new reality for private individuals is information sharing is more sophisticated, more thorough, and more immediate than ever. And I think what we've seen over the last five to seven years is, um, is certainly apt to that. Um, just to give you a bit of a background as to where I am and, and what my background has been over the last five to seven years, I've been dealing with, uh, with assisting governments in development of beneficial ownership registers. Um, around around the Caribbean, so um, so this so the topic of beneficial ownership and economic substance that I'll be reporting on is is something that's uh, that that becomes my daily topic or almost my um, as as common as as eating and sleeping these days it seems. Um, so uh, what I want to go over is is some 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 general information about the trends of of beneficial ownership and economic substance reporting uh, and some of the ins and outs that you may uh, you may very well see as you sort of navigate through the labyrinth of changing standards. Uh, next slide. Um, so the concept of beneficial ownership or collecting beneficial ownership information, as I said, and as Don has said before, isn't a really a new concept, uh, but we have seen an increase over the last five or seven years uh, where we've seen increased pressures for timely access of information. Uh, and this is mainly driven by technological increases. And as, as technology gets more, uh, more efficient um, and you bring about services such as cloud computing, uh, it brings sort of complex systems more into the affordable range for, for governments and, and other uh, organizations that are set to exchange information. Um, jurisdictions that normally used to take weeks or, or even months to exchange information um, now are, are being forced to do so within 24 hours or even in certain cases within an hour, uh, such as uh, the circumstances under the UK exchange of notes. So. Um, it, it's something that that the pressure is continuing to increase and will continue to increase. Um, terminology of beneficial owners um, continues to evolve, uh, and, and that's something that is also a changing goalpost. Ironically enough, um, what, what used to be what used to be plainly an ownership concept now looks more at the concept of control and 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 decision making capacity within a company. Um, so we, we look more much more nowadays behind the curtain of ownership and, and more as to who controls uh, who controls the organization. What is clear is that under most circumstances, the person or persons that have been reported on being the beneficial owners or persons of significant control must be natural persons, and and this is uh, and this has been highlighted by by recent uh, by recent disclosures as well. Uh, there are certain circumstances where structures can designate other legal entities, as you know, uh, where you have certain instances of legal entities or so regulated entities, listed entities, or or investment funds. So there are there are carving out of, of those circumstances. If the reporting entity is one uh, one of these entity types, obviously they can be exempted from providing beneficial ownership information, um, but they still have to disclose at least a, a legal entity. Um, sorry, I'm just getting through my slides. Um, 
so the, the the threshold for reporting is is typically set or the global standards typically set at 25 percent however i just want to highlight the fact that uh, there are 10 percent thresholds for um minimum reporting for AML purposes. And these requirements are slightly different for as, as that for beneficial ownership information reporting. Um, so it's just something just to keep in mind uh, when you're looking at what you're reporting and who you're reporting, especially as we go down the trends of publicly accessible registers and public registers, um, because um, there is there is a growing concern about what information is going to be is going to be publicized if publicly accessible registers are to become a global standard. Um, a question that is asked many times is um, where whether there is a requirement to identify a beneficial ownership for each legal entity, and this is something that does vary from country to country. Um, many countries nowadays, and, and, and many or much of the legislation nowadays, do does require uh, at least one individual entity or or uh, or a legal entity or uh, one individual legal entity as being recognized as a beneficial owner. Uh, there are obviously difficult circumstances where uh, no one has a greater than twenty five percent ownership, either directly or indirectly, and then you have to sort of peel away the curtain and, and look at who who that um, key decision maker or who those key decision makers are within uh, within the organizational structure um, that obviously does require uh, a level of of advice and consulting uh, and, and certainly uh, professionals um, such as us are always available to um, to look at the structures and, and provide advice as to who the appropriate beneficial owner uh, would be within the structure uh, next slide it's important to note that uh, there are international standards which dictate the, um, the growing level of disclosure of beneficial ownership data, and this is not something that's, that, that's done at a country by country level. Uh, there, as, uh, as, we, as we all know, uh, through the FATF, through the OECD, uh, and, and, other, um, and other standard setting bodies, um, that there is a growing pressure to provide increased disclosure of beneficial ownership data. Uh, and this is mainly driven by recommendation 24 from the FATF, um, which defines there should be a mechanism in place that ensures that there is adequate, accurate, and timely beneficial ownership information captured and a mechanism that should be designed to facilitate access. Uh, it does not define, and I think it's an important point to note that it does not define what that mechanism is. Uh, and in fact, really the FATF doesn't, it doesn't even advise on beneficial ownership registers, although uh, most, most countries are, um, are moving in that direction. Um, uh, BDO's recent transparency report, as, as I would have mentioned before, looks at the concern that private clients have when it comes to beneficial ownership information, and it was found that over 90% of high net worth individuals either responded moderately or very concerned about their privacy or the safety, uh, sorry, the, pri the privacy of their data and, and certainly um, their own personal safety when it comes to transparency requirements. Um, there is obviously an underlying um, polar opposite when it comes to um, wh when it comes to the whole concept of uh, privacy and transparency, uh, where where you give up privacy, um, you you end up with transparency, or where you went, or when you want to increase uh, privacy, you obviously give up transparency. So uh, so it's up to a countries and it's up to uh, industries and jurisdictions to to sort of find that happy medium and the happy balance uh, between uh, becoming either either too private or or not private enough. Uh, and, and certainly countries such as the BVI have our um, have have been in, in the spotlight of recently with their development of the beneficial ownership system, which uh, I was uh, which I was involved in, which looks very much at trying to create that balance of um, of disclosing uh, enough information and yet still trying to maintain a uh, a level of privacy and, and providing a sophisticated system of exchange of information. Um, as I said before, uh, transparency does remove. Um, the privacy complement, uh, whereas ignoring transparency also ensures full privacy. Um, so we do have to we do have to get a balance. Uh, current disclosure mechanisms are in place where all countries which utilize a wide network of um, information exchange agreements and MLATs or multilateral um, 
assistance or multi mutual legal assistance treaties um, to efficiently exchange uh, information amongst themselves, and, and that right now is seen as being as being the the best mechanism to deal with disclosure requirements um, where investigations are ongoing within within their own countries. Uh, they reach out within their various networks and um, and request to have the information available upon request. And most countries nowadays have efficient systems of exchange of information so that um, so that they can so that they can um, uh, uh, they can get information uh, very quickly. Um, recent UK amendments, obviously, in the sanctions bill has led um, the, the pendulum to swing more on the increasing transparency requirements where they've introduced the requirements for overseas territories and crown dependencies to implement uh, public accessible registers um, by by 2023 so uh, certainly the discussion is very far from over when it comes to um, public accessible versus private registers the next slide so now that we've looked at, at beneficial ownership a little bit, I want to change gears a little bit and just um, take a few minutes and, and discuss the, the, the recent changes regarding economic substance. Uh, discussions surrounding tax liabilities have obviously um, are obviously much more uh, in, in in focus nowadays, and, and we look much more at uh, not only at at the jurisdictional uh, incorporation of, of entities, but now sort of where um, where a corporation is 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 doing business and where the mind and management of of a company is. And no longer a company is easily able to shift profits to low or no tax jurisdictions without demonstrating that they have a substantial business um, in order to do so. Um, much more focus is placed on the location of mind and management to the debate, which considers location of management, location of board meetings, and location of revenue generating assets when determining exactly what tax should be or where tax should be applied. Um, there are downfalls to this, the, the economic substance debate, obviously, when we look at the shift from bricks and mortar um, to more digital or, or more high tech um, businesses, um, it's much more difficult to, to decide exactly where business is being done. So uh, the debate certainly continues around that. So the entire debate around profit shifting at present, however, remains focused on the nine relevant activities that are highlighted on the screen. Uh, these nine relevant activities are seen to be the highest risk associated with profit shifting and therefore the center of attention when it comes to economic substance legislation worldwide. Tax transparency is achieved through spontaneous exchange of information, which, where, which requires jurisdictions to report on an annual or biannual basis the names of those entities which are incorporated in their jurisdictions but have claimed tax residency in another jurisdiction. Uh, they are required to exchange inf such information to each of the individual donation or each of the individual jurisdictions and putting them on notice of this declaration. Next slide. And finally, with the level of detail required for economic substance declarations, however, this brings the need to ability or the need for the ability to analyze large amounts of information and pull out those entities which either need further analysis or red flags. Technology plays a key role in this process, and jurisdictions are required to frequently um, are frequently reporting to the um, Forum for Harmful Tax Practices or the FHTP, uh, which is part of the OECD with statistical information and the list of the statistics that are required grows by the month uh, as their questions become more and more probing and more and more evasive. Um, these uh, these will uh, these statistics help jurisdictions keeping them on their toes and pushing the industry to more efficient methods of quickly and efficiently collecting new information while providing a strong level of security and protection. Um, and certainly, I guess when we look at the Greek philosophers who say that nothing in life is constant, nothing in life is constant except change, or change is the only constant. I guess is the um, is the um, is how the saying goes. Um, so uh, with that, I will pass the floor on to Thomas, who will look at more at uh, Switzerland's response to transparency and CRS filings. So Thomas, take it away. Thank you, Ryan, and welcome from my side. Um, in my practice at BDO Switzerland, I, on the one hand, support uh, banks, securities firms, other financial institutions in implementing the common reporting standard. 
And on the other hand, I support other entities that are affected as well by CRS, such as, for example, Swiss trust companies. And this is what I'm going to point out in the course of my presentation, in particular, the many pitfalls that a Swiss trust company faces when dealing with the common reporting standard CRS. Next slide, please. Now, if you are an entity under the common reporting standard, your world is binary, I would say. You are either an FI, a financial institution, or an NFE, a non-financial entity. Now, you may find this easy. Uh, it appears to be clear um, what the financial institution uh, may be. However, as you may already know, or as we will see on the next slide, um, our imagination and our common understanding of the term financial institution is somewhat stretched by the common reporting standard. Next slide. Now, when we have a closer look at the definition of financial institution under CRS, we find on the left side depository institution, primarily that's a term for banks. This appears pretty clear that a bank would be a financial institution under, under CRS, under any system whatsoever. We find custodial um, institutions acting as custodians for securities um, makes sense. On, on the right hand side, we find specified insurance companies. That's the term from CRS, um, basically life insurance companies, which to some degree act like banks. You can somehow place money in those insurance companies as you could place money in a bank. But then we get to the pretty interesting category of investment entities, which, which is further subdivided. Um, there are uh, different terminologies for this, for this under CRS. One is the uh, terminology with type A and type B investment entity that I'm using here. Type A sounds pretty clear as well. Um, entities uh, that are active in the investment or administration of financial assets are to be seen as financial institutions, for example, asset managers, pretty clear. But when we get to the bottom, to the type B investment entities, also called professionally managed investment entities, we find quite an interesting definition. So the uh, definition for this subcategory of a financial institution is an entity whose income is mainly attributable to financial assets and which are professionally managed by another financial institution. Now in practice, with this definition, we see many private investment companies, trusts and foundations qualifying as financial institutions for the CRS regime. Now, why is this? One reason is that um, if only banks or similar institutions would fall under the common reporting standard and the uh, system of information exchange, only bankable assets would be reported under CRS because uh, banks obviously can only report what they know about. Now with making uh, PICs, trusts and foundations, financial institutions in their own right, they are um, they have to report in their own right, meaning that they have to report not only bankable assets, but all their assets. Next slide, please. Now, when we have a closer look at this investment entity status, obviously, uh, as I mentioned before, this may apply to trusts. So a trust or also a foundation or a PIC would be an investment entity if it's trustee is a financial institution, if it's trustee mandates a financial institution to administer the trust, or if it's trustee mandates a financial institution to manage the trust's assets. So with this definition, in many cases, PICs, trusts and foundations are financial institutions in their own right and therefore have to perform a reporting under CRS. There are other cases where we don't have financial institutions involved in the management of a trust, but only individuals. In those cases, the trust wouldn't be considered a financial institution. 
Now, you may say that um, there aren't any Swiss trusts. Um, technically speaking, legally speaking, there aren't. But it's not that simple under CRS because for one reason, um, the domicile of a trust under CRS is the domicile of the trustee. And in Switzerland, we do find many trust companies, often with an Anglo-Saxon background, administering trusts, which obviously aren't constituted under Swiss law, but which qualify as Swiss trusts for CRS purposes. And the actual obligations linked to CRS, um, I mean, you, you, you don't find them with the trust as such, but obviously with the trustee, with the trust company. What are those obligations? Next slide, please. Um, to start with, the um, trust or the trustee must register with the Swiss Federal Tax Administration, the SFTA, must identify the accounts which are reportable under CRS. It must inform its customers, um, meaning the reportable persons, about the information reporting, about what financial information is reported, about the partner jurisdictions of Switzerland, for example, to which the information is reported, um, some generic information about how this data may be used, and about certain specific rights under the Swiss Data Protection Act and the CRS Act. Um, in this context, uh, the concept of Swiss banking secrecy may pop up, but there we have an important difference between CRS and US FATCA, because CRS is based on obviously an international treaty first, but then also on a Swiss law. And this Swiss law supersedes the Banking Act and banking secrecy. So in Switzerland, you cannot block the CRS report as such. You can only make sure that the correct information is reported to the correct country. Under FATCA, this is different because it's not based on a Swiss law. So um, any US person has to explicitly release Swiss banks and other financial institutions in order for them to be able to perform a FATCA report. And eventually, once all this information is gathered, the Swiss financial institutions, including trust companies when they're affected, have to um, transfer the reportable information to the Federal Tax Administration, which then forwards it to the account holders, tax authorities. Next slide. Now, normally under CRS, accounts are reported. It's pretty simple for a bank to know what's an account. It may not be as simple for a trust company or a trust to know what's an account that has to be reported under the CRS system. The definition in CRS is any equity or debt interest in the financial institution. Um, this is fairly easy for a limited company where uh, a shareholding would constitute such an equity interest or a loan would constitute a debt interest. It may be more complicated for trusts or foundations. There, um, we find further definitions what is pretty clear, what has been pretty clear for a while is that the settler of the trust and the beneficiaries of the trust are to be treated as such equity interest holders and therefore reportable account holders if they reside abroad. For discretionary trusts, um, a reporting only um, occurs in the years of actual distributions. Otherwise, there wouldn't be anything to report. Then there is a more generic definition about any other person exercising control over the trust who would also have to be reported. Now, does this include trustees? Does this include protectors? In any case, in specific cases, um, there have been a lot of discussions about this. There aren't any specific rules in the actual CRS rules. Then um, some answers came along in the CRS FAQs by the OECD, but some countries didn't follow them. In Switzerland, um, before 2021, in the old CRS guidance notes, there wasn't an obligation to report trustees or protectors, but 
those Swiss um, CRS guidance notes were amended in January this year. And now it is fairly clear that a Swiss trust, meaning a trust with a Swiss trustee, also has to report trustees and or protectors residing abroad. Apart from those equity interest holders, as I mentioned before, debt interest holders, so for example, entities granting a loan to the trust, to the financial institution in question would have to be reported. Now, as you can see, this may get pretty complicated for a Swiss trust company to uh, actually um, find out who has to report it to which country, when, with which financial information and so on. And things don't get easier with the actual Swiss implementation efforts, as you can see on the next slide, please. Because as I said before, technically there aren't any Swiss trusts. So Switzerland really is not a trust man's land. Um, you can see this pretty well, as I said before, in Switzerland's CRS implementation efforts. Uh, if you have a look at Swiss CRS guidance notes, they primarily cover banks and they operate in terms for banks, they deal with accounts and so on, but only from the perspective of banks. We hardly find anything about those concepts of equity debt interest holder and so on that are important for trusts. This leads to, to a lot of legal uncertainty surrounding the, the CRS treatment of trusts, foundations and investment companies, which are also financial institutions with CRS obligations in their own rights. One complex of questions is, for example, uh, loans at arm's length, not at arm's length, are they to be seen as distributions? There are events that may be comparable to loans, for example, a beneficiary which, uh, who may reside in a trust property, is this to be seen as a distribution? We find detailed guidance about those cases in, in the British guidance notes, for example, in the Liechtenstein guidance notes, in guidance notes of other jurisdictions uh, which are more familiar with trusts and foundations, but hardly anything in Switzerland. So, so in practice, uh, to deal with those cases, what we do is we, we, we have to look at foreign guidance notes because we just don't have anything in Switzerland, maybe some uh, scholarly writing, but hardly anything from the authorities. Um, what doesn't help either are inconsistencies between the AML rules and the CRS guidance notes. Um, the CRS guidance notes, they, they are quite simple. They tell banks that they can rely on the information obtained for AML matters in order to fulfill their CRS obligations. Now, um, on the Swiss AML forms that are used by banks and other financial institutions, you do not have to establish an institution's trustee. However, under CRS, you may well have to report this trustee. So we find a gap there in the actual information that has to be obtained. A further problem is that some concepts that are foreseen by, um, by the CRS uh, legal basis aren't actually implemented in the Swiss online portal over which you have to report information. For example, there is the concept of a trustee documented trust. So a trust that is documented by its trustee under the CRS basis in principle, you wouldn't have to register this trust, but only the trustee, which then has to report all reportable information for, for all the trust that it administers. However, in the Swiss online portal, you have to register each individual trust, even if it is a trustee documented trust with this TDT trustee documented trust prefix. And a further imbalance is that um, facilitations, which are actually defined in the Swiss CRS guidance notes, aren't te technically implemented in the online tool. So we may come across a trust or a foundation whose uh, reporting period uh, for its financial statements deviates from the calendar year. And the Swiss guidance notes, they state you can use a reporting period which deviates from the calendar year. However, you cannot complete the fields in the online portal with reporting period which deviates from the calendar year. So those are a few 
of uh, the challenges and, and, and the pitfalls that, that you meet as a uh, trust company dealing with CRS in Switzerland. And uh, with those uh, final remarks, I hand over to Jack. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, all the way from the United States of America, I'm Jack Knuckles, and I head up our national tax office on the private client side of things. So I deal more with high net worth individuals, and Thomas, I deal with trusts, and a lot of trusts, quite frankly. But um, I, I love your no man's land with Swiss, because we often think of the Swiss trusts, and you're saying there's really no such thing, but we, 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 we deviate. Uh, I love this picture here. Don, I don't know if Don, you picked this picture or maybe, maybe Laura did, but take a look at these two people here sitting here, lovely ladies. One's got a big old grin on her face and the other's just sitting there kind of looking at the information. Do you think that's a picture of our clients, our high net worth individual clients? Do you think they're ecstatic that the world is sharing their information around the globe? Oh no, they'd be tearing their hair out, and bouncing their heads against that table. That is not a picture of our clients, I can assure you. So who is that a picture of? Is that a picture of the tax authorities in the United States of America getting information from Swiss banks? It could be. They're ecstatic because they're seeing all this information on U.S. persons with deposits in Switzerland banks. Cool. They, they're they, ecstatic. They must be undercover tax inspectors, Jeff. <laughs> exactly. Or, <laughs> or, as Ryan mentioned earlier, are these reporters reviewing the Pandora Papers and they're ecstatic because of all the information that they're gathering that was arguably attained illicitly, right? And so this is the topic we're talking about today is transparency and, and, and my concern, and I we talked about the corporate and certainly uh, the financial institutions are struggling and spending billions of dollars dealing with trying to comply with the worldwide wide requ requirements. Um, Laura, let's go to the next slide, please. So yes, we started it all in the United States of America with our Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, FACTA, and that's where we told the world, we've had it, we can't stand it anymore, our U.S. citizens are hiding their money around the globe, we know they are, and we want you to tell us about it, and the world goes, well, that's your problem, that's not our problem, and we go, yeah, we're going to make it your problem because we're going to withhold against you. Uh, and oh, everybody in the world's investing in U.S. assets. So we're going to withhold against you if you don't comply. What? You can't do that. Oh, yes, we can. And Switzerland goes, well, that violates our country's laws. We can't have financial institutions disclosing. It's a violation. People would go to jail. Figure it out, Switzerland. Figure it out, the rest of the world. And they did. And now we have common reporting standards. <laughs> so. Um, uh, my focus here is uh, individual taxpayers, but we do have professionals within the United States, primarily in our New York City office that focus much on the things that Thomas just talked about is um, compliance around the globe and uh, financial institutions and non-financial institutions which have uh, reporting requirements under FACTA. That information, that data, as Thomas indicated, it is flowing, as Ryan indicated as well. So it's flowing around the globe and our U.S. tax authorities are receiving that data. And as Don mentioned, it is enormous flow of data. Well, when the US gets that data, what do they do with it? They analyze it. Um, our taxpayers in the United States did over the last calendar year start to receive notices. And the notices were very kind. They just said, oh, oh, we noticed you have deposits in foreign countries. You should be aware that you should be filling out the following form, 8938. And our clients were getting this and we were all running around like crazy because most of our clients had filed that form and they got the notice anyway. So then we felt compelled to respond to it. But the reason I bring it up is the government of the United States of America is getting the data and they are analyzing it and they will hunt you down. They do throw people in jail for failure to comply with our foreign bank account reporting forms uh, if it's willful. 
And even if it's innocent, they will make you miserable by imposing very significant penalties. Um, we have a foreign trust filing requirement, Thomas, you'll be glad to know. So uh, people in the United States who have or are, or are beneficiaries of a foreign trust have to file this paperwork. Um, this last year, BDO was the, uh, had a client who was the fine recipient of a notice from our Internal Revenue Service. And, and Don, it was just a mild penalty, um, $35 million. A $35 million penalty for failure to notify the Internal Revenue Service that this client had a foreign trust, $35 million. Oh, by the way, this person was an accidental resident of the United States. They were from another country of which we do not have a U.S. income tax treaty. They spent too much time here, Don, over 183 days. Welcome to the United States of America. Big, warm bear hug. Tax you on your worldwide income. And by the way, you have to let us know about your foreign trust. If you don't let us know about your foreign trust, we hit you with a $35 million penalty. Hello. Welcome to the United States. Um, by the way, these rules were all in place prior to FACTA. So we had a very robust filing system. We just got upset at the world and we decided, well, we're gonna make you guys tell us about our US citizens and our US residents uh, with deposits in your banks. Um, we are one of probably two countries in the world and we are the only modern industrialized country in the world that taxes our citizens regardless of residency. So if you're a US citizen, we tax you on your worldwide income. We don't care if you've been living in the United Kingdom your entire life. If you're a US citizen, we want you to file an individual tax return in the United States and report your worldwide income. We're the only modern industrialized country in the world that does so. So why do you think we wanna know if US persons have deposits in foreign banks? If I'm a US citizen living in France, of course I have banks, uh, deposits in a, in a French bank. Of course I'm dealing business in France. Of course I may have my own companies in France, but from a US perspective, all of that is foreign. And so US persons have to report that. And as if you've already heard, failure to report that can re result not only in, in significant penalties, but you can go to jail for failure, willful failure to let the government know about these foreign accounts. So um, Laura, next slide, please. So we have a voluntary compliance system in the United States. Uh, you know, you just need to report everything, income worldwide. Um, if you don't do so, um, if we find out about it, uh, either through whistleblowing or through an audit, um, we will uh, penalize you and make you very uncomfortable. If we feel like it's willful, they, they will uh, throw you in jail. And I've already mentioned the $35 million penalty. As far as the politicians are concerned, um, wealthy people are not paying their fair share. And we're hearing this consistently from the current administration that the uh, taxes that are being imposed on the wealthy is insufficient. Right now they're estimating um, the progressives in our country are estimating the gap between what is being paid and what should be paid, $1 trillion a year. Now, I don't know that I buy that, but if you're a politician and you believe that, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And it goes back to the whole element of transparency. You're going to want to know about this net worth and you're going to tax it. Um, at the one of the shocking things is that final bullet on the right hand side in June of this year, ProPublica released an article on income taxes of wealthy Americans claiming they had data on thousands, thousands of the wealthiest Americans in the United States, and they had it for 15 years. And the information that's been published, and I'm surprised we haven't heard about more about this, this information was leaked and it had to probably come from the Internal Revenue Service. Well, golly gee, I always thought it would be confidential. How in the world did this get to ProPublica? They're analyzing this data and they're saying the wealthiest Americans are not paying their fair share. And if you're one of those wealthy Americans, you may be terrified that certain individuals are gaining access to this information and it could be used to I don't know, kidnap a family member, um, 
do certain things against your family, which you prefer that they not do because now you're public. And this is the concern we have on the individual side. I get it, privacy versus transparency. And as Ryan indicated, uh, Don, it, it is absolutely essential. I know we gotta have a tug of war between the government wanting to know and, and, and the privacy of our, our clients, which is essential uh, to the security of their net worth. Um, and, and hopefully uh, there's a happy balance, but getting that balance and with the release of these Pandora papers, there's gonna be a huge emphasis towards transparency because the world is gonna be shocked about all this information about foreign leaders and them hiding money around the world. And so with that, Don, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Jack. Welcome to London, there's the gherkin. <laughs> Um, so yes, so CRS in the UK, we are very much in a, almost a post CRS uh, regime. In fact, I was talking to HMRC recently, and they want to know actually, um, interestingly, um, we're asking for any anonymous anecdotes as to how people are avoiding CRS because they are very focused on CRS is here, we're getting the data, thank you very much. Um, one in 10 individuals living in the UK has an overseas bank account. So they didn't know that pre-CRS, they now do know that. And I think they were quite surprised by the extent of uh, offshore holdings. So 10%, 10 of individuals living in the UK have money outside the UK. Nothing wrong with that as long as you correctly report it. So, um, and of course that's the challenge. So next slide, please. This is really just a reminder, and I think most of you on the call will know this. Um, what, what is CRS in terms of uh, the OECD um, Global Forum that I mentioned at the start? Um, and what does that mean? Well, it's working is the answer. As Jack said, the data is flowing. Um, at the end of 2020, which is the last big OECD transparency report, there was 105 jurisdictions doing this, automatically exchanging information. And as I say to people when they come and see me, um, you know, th this is without your permission. This was without your knowledge. It is happening. Um, and it's outside of your control. So, and, and I think that does baffle a lot of people. Um, you know, thankfully, most people who walk through our doors want to pay the right amount of tax. Um, what they are blissfully ignorant of is the amount of data that is flowing around the world about them. Next slide, please. Uh, again, this is a bit of history, but this just shows you the buildup of the CRS countries. And it takes time for this to flow through to tax compliance, reporting, and then the back investigations. But on the basis we've had early adopters since 2017, so information flowing since 2018, and the bulk of the countries then came on 2018. So we saw information pre-pandemic in 2019. We have seen certainly the UK tax authorities, and I know largely they copy a lot of what happens in other um, G5 countries, uh, taking action using this data. Very sophisticated data analytics. HMRC is invested in technology. They do have good artificial intelligence, cross-referencing CRS data with residency, border control, social security, all the other government data that is held about an individual that is cross-referenced. And we have seen that in practice, which can be quite shocking for individuals. Um, it can be quite useful if individuals are playing off one government department against another um, and, and they get caught. Um, but yeah, very interesting. Next slide, please. And again, what I always get asked, and, and Thomas has covered this a bit in relation to uh, trusts and the, the Swiss perspective, but what actually is on that data? Um, and as you know, it's largely driven by 
passports. So people who have multiple passports, there will be multiple reporting of CRS data. Residency, now there's not necessarily a detailed check of tax residency status. Sometimes that can be incorrect, um, but that does lead to the data flowing to a particular country. And then all the other uh, information um, about the income, um, if there's a capital sale, the proceeds, and I've seen a lot of people living in the UK, as we know, the, the Brits love their foreign holiday homes, they've sold their holiday home, uh, capital proceeds, uh, gone into a foreign bank account, and that capital sale has uh, then been reported to HMRC. Why haven't you told us about the lovely villa in France or the gorgeous house in Tuscany that you sold? Um, we've had a lot of a lot of those examples flowing through. Um, other financial assets. Um, does the tax authority always understand the foreign asset? No, they don't. So pensions. Um, Jack, we've had some 401k questions. <laughs> we always get those, those wrong in the UK. Um, pension funds, very confusing. Uh, insurance policies, very confusing. Um, other types of unit trust holdings. There might be no tax implications whatsoever. They might just be a wrapper, a holding vehicle, but CRS data is reported and that leads to questions. Um, so I've had quite a few panicked individuals through my door who have said, I haven't not reported anything, Dawn, and I've got my tax return right. I've definitely got it right. And we've drilled down. And actually, interesting now, HR, HMRC will actually give us the country. So if we phone HMRC and say, please tell us which country it relates to and which financial institution it relates to, they will tell us those two pieces of information, which then I can go back to my individual and say, you know, it's this country and this, and often there is no additional tax due. It is actually, it is that pension fund that they had when they were an expat and they've just left there. Um, and I think, you know, pensions for internationally mobile people is a big problem under transparency reporting. Next slide, please. So it sounds like um, our, our beloved IRS and HMRC have been speaking, Jack, because we have a very similar approach. We are prompting people, nudge, we like to use the word nudge here, to say, hey, we've got this CRS data, why don't you have another look at your tax return and make sure it's correct? So very, very similar. Um, and we get a range of emotions um, when people get those letters. We get, um, Dawn, shall I just throw it in the bin? No, don't just throw it in the bin. Through to, am I going to jail? Well, not if you tell the truth and the whole truth. So, and everything else in between. But it has led to a lot of detailed reviews of tax returns. And um, in the UK, as many of you know, we make it quite complicated because we do have um, a status called non-domiciled individuals, which does allow people to not report their worldwide income. Um, but do they always get that status right? Um, and do they trip up on some of the anti-avoidance rules around that status? Um, yes, they do. And the CRS data has really, um, again, shone a spotlight on, on, on that reporting. So um, I'm not going to go through all of these. I mean, you can see, for those of you who know a bit about UK tax, that each one of these bullet points, the CRS data has led to questions. And I have had ex examples of all of these um, where, if you like, problems have come to the surface or just a lack of understanding with the CRS data. And actually, it's interesting because the big, the one fundamental problem that, that the UK has is, of course, we have this eccentric tax year of 6th of April to the 5th of April. Um, and uh, we now, you'll be pleased to know, my global colleagues have a consultation to change the end of that tax year to the 31st of December. And that, again, is something triggered by the CRS data, in my view. Um, 
so yeah i'm i'm only going to talk for a couple more minutes because i can see we have a couple of questions so if you have a question and you're listening please do type it into the chat now and we'll 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 come on to those questions but next slide please so what in practice do we see i mean i think i've mentioned a lot of this already but we definitely see people with foreign bank accounts outside the UK that haven't reported them correctly. Uh, we then see what I would call technical errors. So people who are caught by anti-avoidance rules, trusts, as Thomas has demonstrated, are horribly complicated. And the reporting of income and gains in trusts, also inheritance tax charges in trusts, is, is often misunderstood. And then we've had quite a few individuals who, you know, with family situations where parents have put money into their kids' names without telling them, um, or maybe they did tell them, but maybe they've forgotten about it, or, you know, great uncle Sid has died and left them a load of money. Um, I haven't found that great uncle yet, but, um, you know, and that has only come to light through the CRS data. So some quite amazing stories on, on, on a personal human level. Um, next slide, please, which I think is my final slide, which I think is perfectly synchronized with what Jack said, is um, does transparency drive voluntary disclosure? Um, well, the OECD would say that's the whole purpose. Um, and I think, you know, anecdotally, um, I can tell you in the UK, yes, it does. I mean, the nudge approach um, definitely has encouraged people to make voluntary disclosure. We have a similar penalty regime that is much lighter if you make uh, voluntary disclosure. We have uh, a disclosure facility that's ongoing for offshore. And again, that's because of transparency data. Um, HMRC doesn't have the resources to investigate everybody, but um, they do want people to come forward voluntarily and tell them about uh, anything that's incorrect and largely they will deal with it in a civil process um, if full disclosure is made. So that's the good news and we can end with the final bullet point there, peace of mind. Um, and I think we've got a few minutes um, for those of you who've, who've um, just allowed an hour, um, we've got a few minutes to take a couple of questions um, please do type them into, into the box if, if you have any questions. So I think the first one is for Ryan, actually. So I'm going to flip back straight back to Ryan. Um, and this is more of a practical question, Ryan. So how, <laughs> quite interested in this myself, how in practice can a taxpayer demonstrate economic substance? And I guess that's around record keeping or you know, what have you seen the tax authorities ask for? in practice? Um, yeah, I mean, good question. Um, I mean, typically, and again, I guess the, the first, the first probably caveat you have to you have to look at is is that um, it's the it's the company and not the taxpayer that's one doing the reporting. Obviously, it's going to be a, a human individual, but it's the it's the com the filings for for declarations of economic substance are done on on a corporate level and not on an individual level. Um, so that would be that would be certainly point number one. Um, the next, I guess, the next point is it does it does sort of flow through a decision tree. Uh, typically, what the the models that we've seen the country is using is essentially the first question that would be asked is is which which jurisdiction are you claiming is the company claiming tax residency um, that can either be in the country um, of, of of the company of, of the company for instance like the BVI for instance uh, or uh, if it's a BVI company for instance they can claim tax residency in another country like the UK uh, and, and if they're claiming it in, in another country um, as I said before then spontaneous exchange of information happens and no other disclosure of information is required um, to the BVI authorities, but then, uh, or, or the authority that you're reporting to, but then there would obviously be reporting requirements that would likely come up or that should come up uh, when, when the information is spontaneously exchanged uh, with that jurisdiction. Um, and then from then it just becomes a, it becomes a reporting of statistics. So um, the, the tax authorities are, are, are very much looking at where um, the, where the company is making their decisions. And a lot of times that's driven by board of directors meetings. Uh, they they seem to hound a lot on, 
are the board of directors meeting physically being held in the jurisdiction that you're reporting your your tax residency at? Um, so that to them is very important. Um, so and it's not only that uh, it's not only that the board of directors meeting is held there, but all of the directors or or at least a quorum of the directors must be physically present at that board of directors meeting. Obviously, with COVID, um, it, it does throw a bit of a, a, a different a slant into it. I'm not exactly sure how the tax authorities are sort of handling that right now. Um, we certainly haven't haven't been given too much insight on on that side, but um, there is there is that case of well, because you can't fly right now, or you can't travel. How exactly are you going to be able to handle your your um, your uh, your your board of directors meetings? But then they'll also look at outsourcing activities. If, if you're outsourcing your activities, how many how many um, how many employees um, full time equivalent employees do you have in that country compared to your your worldwide full time equivalent employees and so on? So it it, it is it is very much a data driven reporting from from that point on, and then the tax authorities will will hone in on with red flags and so on in the background. Uh, so they typically set up red flags in their systems to sort of hone in on those kind of oh, those companies where the information that are being provided doesn't really make sense. Similar to what you're probably seeing with um, HMRC or or Canadian Customs and Revenue Agency or your other tax jurisdictions. Yeah, yeah, excellent. So yeah, keep your board minutes, as we always say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> keep your board minutes. Good. Yeah. A couple. Of, we've got two more questions. Then we'll then then we'll finish um, everybody. But I, I like this question. Any views from anybody oh. on why zero income tax jurisdictions, such as Saudi and the UAE, have signed up for CRS? So I guess the point there is, you know, there isn't a loss of tax for them. Um, I don't know if any of you have any views on on that. Um, I mean, my view would be international pressure to not be blacklisted by the OECD, um, and and yeah. and you know that kind of reputational status um, I, I would be my view. I mean, I can handle it certainly from somebody who lives in a zero tax jurisdiction or or a low tax jurisdiction. Um, I, I mean, most of these jurisdictions are 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 pro. Reg, um, how, how, do, how is the best way to put it? Um, they want to maintain transparency and they do believe in, in, tra in the transparency regimes, tax transparency. Um, so they are, they are open and wanting to comply with international standards when it comes to re um, reporting of inf information. So uh, I, I think that's the, major, that's the major drive why they would want to sign up is, is, is that they are um, they they do they do follow and they do believe in in the regime regarding transparency, but they also do believe in in the regime of protecting um, rights of privacy where where it uh, where it where it's needed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, and it is cooperation. It's an international yeah. cooperation point, exactly. isn't it? As you said, they believe in it and they want to cooperate internationally. Yeah. Okay. Final question. Then I think we'll close because I'm conscious people back to back their diaries. Um, trust often this is a question to you, I think, Thomas, although I, I might be able to help as well. Trusts often invest through underlying companies. So you've got the trust level and the company level um, and they hold no direct investments at, at the trust level. Do you still think that a trust would would still be a financial institution in, in that example? Um, so I guess all the investments are in the underlying company. Um. Well, in, in, in principle, each entity must be assessed in its own right as regards its uh, CRS status. And the trust may well still be a financial institution, but the, the trust assets that would then be reportable would primarily be the, the interest uh, as it is booked uh, in the underlying companies. Yeah, so which, may be a, which may be a mere book value, uh, which may not reflect reality. Yeah, and if it receives any dividends up or yeah, whatever. Obviously. Yeah, obviously, yeah. 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 The income yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I think we can close there. We appreciate your attention and listening today um, and your questions and engagement. So thank you from all of us. Best wishes. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.